This is the very first um, Fire Station Creative podcast here in Fife, and we're with my friend uh, Richard Jobson, who I always think of as a renaissance man, because he's achieved so much in many different media throughout his career. But I think you're the best person to give an overview of of um, wh what you do, Richard, as an artist. Well, it's very kind of you to call me a renaissance man, but you probably mean I'm just because I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I started off uh, as a kid here in Dunfermline uh, with a band called The Skids. I joined The Skids when I was 16 years old, straight from school. And The Skids went on to great success very, very quickly and um, became a top-selling band from the punk genre and ended up with number one albums and top ten singles. Uh, the Skids eventually split up and I started a second band called The Armoury Show, which was much more uh, kind of on the arty left field side of music and, and it wasn't so successful as, as The Skids. We only made one album. And from there I went on to uh, start writing. I wrote a book called uh, 16 Years of Alcohol that would go on to become my debut movie as a director. We have that here, actually. We'll discuss that later. Uh, and we, uh, I then from then I um, worked on television. I did a lot of TV presenting for a variety of different channels, mostly Sky TV running their movie channel area. So I did all the main interviews, did a weekly show reviewing films, and that gave me the breakthrough into making films. So I made my debut movie for Sky as a producer called Tube Tales, which did incredibly well. It was picked up by Mel Gibson's company and sold all over the world. And then I went on to make a film for Miramax where they dreaded Harvey Weinstein that uh, was, was not particularly successful, but was uh, an experience, I guess. And then from there, I, uh, I decided to start directing. And that's when I did 16 Years of Alcohol. I decided to do one of my own books. And um, I went on from there. So I've directed quite a few movies. Um, most of the work I do is collaborative, but the, my favourite thing that I do is sit and writing because I can do that on my own. I don't need anybody else. And I've I work. Or I've written a couple of novels, um, The Speed of Life, uh, Into the Void. I've got some more coming out soon. And they're they're novels that are definitely in the firmament of pop culture. You know, music's a big deal in there. Fashion's a big deal. I use a lot of um, scatological pop culture ideas in them so I think that I'm kind of firmly rooted in the place that I came from right back at the beginning which was kind of music and um, word related and even the art that I make is all text based so you know words are my thing I'm all, I'm all about words as you can probably tell as I ramble on so I mean when I was a kid I, I always knew you as a movie man because uh, that was my generation and I, I've got clear memories of watching you presenting on TV, um, but it's only when I got to know you within the last five years that I've got a full appreciation of, of your your um, involvement in music. Th I'm right in thinking the Skids, they formed in 1977, is that right? The Skids formed in 1977, yeah, and uh, as I said, I was 16 years old. Um, punk rock had happened in this late summer of 76. 1976 was famous because... It was one of the hottest summers in, in on record, and riots broke out all over the country. The the country was in a bit of a social mess. The Labour government at the time just couldn't get their, their hands on uh, controlling inflation, controlling uh, a very divisive uh, kind of infrastructure of people who felt that the country needed a revolution of a kind. And out of that, there was a revolution, and it was called punk rock. And, and it just made sense to me at the time as a young kid. I was already... The, mu the music that became the influence of punk rock or the genesis of punk rock was music I was already listening to. You know, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, David Bowie, MC5. These were the bands that I listened to anyway. So when punk rock came along, for me, even though... We were quite far away from the heat of London, where punk rock kicked off. Uh, it made perfect sense to me. You know, it just made sense because all all of the people I knew here in Dunfermline were listening to Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Wishbone Ash, 
just you know stuff that I just absolutely loathed mm. and um, so I was a bit of an isolated figure. Was a bit of a, I did look weird in the town because I was a punk before punk happened. If you know with the way I dressed and the way I wore my hair and I've I've seen photographs from that era <coughs> when you were a very young man, sixteen, seventeen years old, and you're wearing a like a leopard skin fur coat. In, in this area, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just yeah. unimaginable to me. <laughs> you could uh, yeah, well, initially I, I wore a, a suit I picked up in the grass. The grass market in Edinburgh in that era was full of second-hand stores, and and we called places I think they were called models or models where homeless men slept. Uh, weirdly enough, the phenomenon of ho homelessness in the seventies was always men who I think had mostly alcohol-related problems. They never really. It wasn't a female problem as such. Or maybe it was, but it wasn't so evident. And there was lots of second-hand stores in the grass market. You got to find these incredible clothes. So I wore an evening suit from the 1920s, but with skin-tight trousers, winkle pickers, no shirt, a dog collar, and I had black hair with a white stripe down it, like a, like a bit like a, a ferret. And so, of course, I was very identifiable, especially in Dunfermline, which at the time had a fairly macho culture that was prevalent. And so people were fairly antipathetic towards how I looked and it made people quite violent towards me. And of course, this increasingly made me more feral. So by the time I was invited to audition for a Stuart Adamson, who was trying to start a punk band, he wasn't interested in, in the fact that I couldn't really sing or I couldn't really dance. It was the fact that I had the the look, I had the attitudes, I had all the things that you needed for a front man in a punk band, you know, they were already in place. Mm. And of course, I had the musical knowledge. It mm -hmm. wasn't like I suddenly found this new genre. The genre was already part of me. So, um, you know, I lucked out with him, but he lucked out with me, I think. Yeah. So I was at the the gig on Friday night. You, you played in Carnegie Hall in Dunfermline, and you told a story about uh, listening to Char the song Charles on the radio. I didn't realise that that was the first hit the kids had. Well, it wasn't so much that it was a hit. It was a first record that we made ourselves. The whole ethos of punk rock, um, beyond its kind of anti-establishment uh, positioning, was a DIY culture, which of course means do it yourself. I think in 2022, DIY kind of means something else. It means don't involve yourself, unfortunately. But um, for us, it meant do it yourself. So we had started our own magazine. It was called Kingdom Come. It was a, it was called a fanzine. You would call it in modern parlance. You'd call it a website. Mm -hmm. But we would um, put together our views on politics. We would review other records. We would interview some of the people that we liked or admired, artists or writers or musicians. And um, we would write fun, gossipy stuff. And, and we had a little graphic novel area in it. And we did that ourselves, published our own magazine monthly called Kingdom Come. And uh, we would staple it all together, get it photocopied and staple it, and, and then go and sell it at gigs. And we did really well with it. And um, so we decided that was the beginning of our own culture, because by this time we were writing our own music. And we decided to, to record our own music rather than look for a big record company to pick us up. That was never going to happen, we didn't think. So we struck upon the idea of a label called No Bad Records, which, in course, in, in Fife vernacular, kind of no bad means, it doesn't mean it's terrible, it doesn't mean it's great, it's just kind of cool, you know? It's so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just no bad. And it's such a, uh, and, and of course, we call it, the first record was No Bad One, but of course, in, in Fife, it's No Bad One. So it's, it's got a double meaning, and it just felt perfect. And Stuart Adamson um, wrote all the songs at that point in time. I didn't write the words at the beginning of the skids. It was Stuart. And he had written two or three songs. One was called Test Shoot Babies, which was, you know, he was he was quite forward thinking, very progressive socialist, uh, Stuart. He, he was always thinking ahead. And uh, Charles was the key song of the time and uh, that he had written, which was about how automation will replace manual labor. And... It was a song without a chorus. The uh, you know so everybody in, in, in the early days of punk wrote a two three minute song, but it was essentially all about the chorus. Charles didn't have a chorus, so it so it stood out. It was different, and it also had this remarkable guitar style that he had developed, which uh, without being overly technical, it means we had to detune our guitars 
um, from standard tuning and it would give his open string sound a very unique style which he later developed when he went into big country into a much more kind of Scottish bagpipey sound which is not something I'm so fond of but the early days with the skids it was developed into something really intriguing and brand new it made us really stand out so we made the record uh, and we just about it were able to afford paying for it from the money we made from selling the fanzine and then uh, we sent it to John Peel at uh, Radio 1 in, in London he was the iconic DJ that played all new mu music he would play punk music he would play he played poets like Ivor Cutler or Van de Graaff Generator, then it would be The Clash or Susie and the Banshees, then it would be Reggae, then it would be MC5. It was just our station, you know, he was a great mentor to all of us. So we sent him the record with no hope that he would actually play it because obviously punk bands were springing up all over the UK, so, you know, he would have a vast choice to choose from. But we did send the covering letter about who we were and we're not from a big city, we're from Fife, um, we didn't go to art school, we don't have those kind of influences, we just believe in the movement, because we saw punk as a movement. Would you have sent him a, a, a tape, a cassette tape, or was it an re actual record? Or how, how would yeah, well, we had made our own record by this time, right, okay. we, we, had, we had, had pressed no bad records, we right. got it. we did it with a, a guy from a record store in Dunfermline called Sandy Muir. Yeah. Um, it's now a betting shop, sadly, but it was a cool shop, and we, he didn't really sell punk records, we had to go to Edinburgh to buy them, and one day I went in there, and uh, obviously I was quite aggressive as a youngster, he didn't like me coming in his shop, he was very straight, Sandy, and uh, the only thing we liked about him is he had a scimitar car, which we thought were a bit science fiction at the time, but he wasn't our kind of guy, and we said to him, listen, there's so many of us now, these young punks, we're all over the place, and there's nobody sells the records. Start selling the records. You'll make money from us. Mm. And lo and behold, he took that on board, and, and he started to make a fortune because the, it was the only shop in the Holy Fife that was selling punk records. So people would come from Dundee or Kirkcaldy or St Andrews or, you know, um, Cooper just to buy these records at that shop. Am I right in thinking that that shop was only a stone's throw from where we're sitting right now? That store, his shop is just uh, literally 100 metres from here on the other side of the kinema, and it's now a, uh, it's now a betting shop, right. you know, it's next to the old uh, public toilets. Right. That's right, so, but on a Saturday um, morning through the afternoon, that place was the hub of punk rock in the whole of Central Fife. Mm. So you would have two, sometimes 300 kids hanging out there, buying records, talking with their gear on. So then we, the, a lot of them would come up to our practice space, which was up by Queen Anne's School, and we'd do an impromptu concert every Saturday to all these kids from our rehearsal space. So we had become a cult band, because we were the only band mm. uh, at the time uh, from this area, and we became a big cult thing. So when we went to play a gig, everyone was always shocked. Like we would play with the Buzzcocks or the Clash, for example, or the Stranglers. All of these big bands were shocked because we brought our own following. Mm. And, and the following was huge by that time. So if, if the Skids were supporting the Buzzcocks and there was, it was an 800 person capacity, 400 of those people would be Skids fans. Mm. They wouldn't be Buzzcocks fans. So it really freaked all these bands out from England that who are these guys? So word of mouth spread very fast and with the help of um, John Peel playing our record every night, we, we were invited to come and play in London and Manchester and, uh, and, that, and then they got signed up by Virgin Records and, um, and went on to great success with them. Right, so at, at what point would you say that you felt like you had really crossed the threshold? Was it, was it the signing of the contract or was it the, um, was it, did it happen over a few months? Um, well, I think these things are quite organic, really. There wasn't like a moment where, you know, we suddenly hit the ticker tape. But I think uh, certainly the momentum just got bigger and bigger. The, the, the thing about the skids that I think was different from some of the other bands was when we played or like we played with The Clash, we would do our gig and then suddenly when Joe Strummer and Mick Jones and Paul Simon were on stage, they would look down and they would see the skids at the front, you know, mm, jumping yeah. up and down to yeah. their music. So we always had this fairly egalitarian view that 
the music we were making was for the people who were the same as us because we were replacing these dinosaurs who had this kind of very us and them attitude to rock and roll yeah and and they, and they were living in they're all travel traveling around in private jets and you used to play for schools though didn't you uh, that was much later later yeah yeah, we played at schools. Um, well, we d- I mean, way before that, we did a thing called. Uh, but we did a thing called Kids for Kids, which um, obviously sounds a bit dodgy now, but at the <laughs> time it wasn't dodgy at all. Because I was so young when I joined the band, I legally wasn't allowed to go into those venues. I had to have a special pass. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, the laws in those days were so draconian. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to sign my contract with Virgin because I was so young. Um, it was uh, preposterous, and then going on tour with the Stranglers, I had, they had to prove that I had a mentor continuing with my education because I was that young, mm. and, and my the only person that had any um, cr- credentials or qualifications to be a teacher was Hugh Cornwell from the Stranglers, and I was meant to go to his room every night after a gig and do English geography and history. Uh, trust me, I learned a lot from Hugh, but it was not history, <laughs> geography, and uh, 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 English. But um, so I was very young and, and we did these gigs as kids were pulling in big crowds very early on. But a lot of the venues I, I wasn't actually legally allowed to go into, but I was because I was the performer. But the people my age weren't allowed to come. So I, because uh, I was a bit more aggressive than the other members in the band, I, I demanded that we did a, a five o'clock gig for people who had just left school. And, and then we played at eight o'clock to the older people. Mm. And all of the venues said yes. Uh, to it and so we played to two full houses every day so we did double gill double bill six days a week with one day off for nearly um you know the the full year the almost the full 50 weeks 52 weeks of the year uh and which um i think the other members of the band found exhausting i, I don't know really looking back at a, a just an inexhaustible ye- energy but which of course comes from youth mm. but it was important to me to do these gigs with these uh people who were my age, you know, because Stuart and uh, the other members of the Skids were much older than me um, at the time. Not in attitude, but in years, you yeah. know. But I, I definitely felt it was important that the people that I saw as the same as me were able to see us. And so that's where that was born from. And then we took it further. We, en- we ended up, when we were quite a big band, turning up at schools with the permission of the headmaster or headmistress, all over, all, all over Britain, um, playing in the lunchtime break. So a lot of these kids who would be 12, 13, the first band they ever saw would have been the kids playing in their school. And they would have seen us the night before on top of the pops. Yeah. And, it w- and you could see it was like a, a penny drop moment for them that suddenly this is going to be their band. And weirdly enough, now that I'm out playing again, one of the great joys of it is meeting those people. Because, of course, they would be so young they wouldn't even be allowed into our early shows because they were so young. But now they've got to see us at last. Yeah. And, um, you know, we try our best to put the same kind of energy into the shows now as we did way back in 77, 78, 79, 1980, um, when we were much younger, of course. But I think, you know, somehow or other we've found that pulse. And, mm. you know, when that pulse isn't there, you know, excuse this terrible metaphor, I won't be there either. You know, it's got to have the joy and fun in it for me. Mm. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not a cynical person. And I really believe in the people that come to see us. So I want to give them something back. And that's how I was in the early days without being too self-righteous about it. It was important to me that there was no differentiation between the audience and the performers. We were the same thing. I think that comes from um, being brought up in Scotland Scotland uh, was a socialist country then, and uh, my father was a, a, a miner. He was in the union, and so he kind of indoctrinated me with these values that I tried to embed in the band. And it's difficult when you start making money because the, the, some of the areas become slightly blurred, and it's difficult not to lose sight of these things. But hopefully, I've managed to retain that sense of. You know, it's never us and them. We're, it's just, it's just us. All of us. Yeah, yeah it's just us. So them never became part of my vocabulary. That, that your gigs certainly have that atmosphere about them, and the way that you relate to the audience. Um, it's particularly in the acoustic gigs. So, in 
2017, the band reformed, and I think your first meeting was was downstairs in this building in the cafe. Okay. Yeah, but we we had done some gigs before that, um, where a U2 and Green Day, the two biggest rock and roll bands on the planet, had done a cover version of a song I wrote in Dunfermline Library called "The Sense of Coming," and it was an, an enormous success. Uh, it was a charity record, but people had a wanted to know more about the band, mm. and so it kind of grew out of that. Really, we did a few gigs. Um, we were invited to play tea in the park, and it was great fun. But we never thought we'd ever go out and play again, never mind go and record a new album. But it, it slowly happened, you know, just the, the interest from that. People kept on asking us. I didn't want to do it because I'm not a nostalgic person. I didn't, I didn't really want to be part of this new movement, which is called the Heritage Trail, you know, of bands just kind of living in their former glory. It had to have some relevance. So I said I would do it if we recorded new material mm. and give it a go. And if the material wasn't any good, then I'm not doing it. But we recorded a new album called Burning Cities. And yeah, you're absolutely right. We we use the fire station as our hub. Um, I don't live in Scotland, but when I'm here, I this is our base, you know. Um, mm. So we, we have our meetings here and talk about stuff here. And, and it's the right kind of environment for us. I mean... When we were kids, we always dreamed of having a place like the fire station in existence, a place that was for us. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm not such a big drinker. I really don't like pubs, you know. And in the days when we went to pubs, uh, people smoked, you know, and I mm. don't smoke. And uh, I just found it very difficult, that culture. It was never part of me. I prefer listening to music or reading, and I, I, I don't mind being on my own. There was no places like the fire station. But when we, when we used to travel to um, Brussels or Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Hamburg, Berlin, Munich, these places were everywhere. Yeah, They were part of the modern landscape of Europe because young people hung out, young people who had ambition and wanted to advance themselves uh, intellectually. These places existed for them and it never existed for us. And the gallery system, as I like to call it back in those days, were actually anti us. They didn't want people like us, little feral punk people in their galleries, you know, that was for a bourgeois audience. And, yeah. and uh, used to, I used to hate these places. I remember with my first ever royalty check on the skids, um, I went to, it was called the um, Edinburgh Frame, uh, Edinburgh Printmakers uh, Gallery. And it's now where, it's just outside Waverley Station where the fruit market gallery is now. That's where they used to be based. And I went in there and there was a picture of a man suspended in animation. He's like he's doing a kind of backswing flip type thing. And he was just kind of suspended in the space. It was done by a wonderful artist called Harry Holland. And, and the guy in the printing was very aware that this wee punky feral guy was in there. And he came up to me and said, what, what do you want? Rather than can I help you or... But what do you want? You know, mm. and I just thought that was kind of how that part yeah. of the world looked upon people who weren't part of their world. Yeah, and it's uh, still like that to some degree. I, well, it is yeah. unfortunately still like that. Yeah, and, and I said I want to buy that, and he and he just laughed. He laughed at me, this guy, and so um, I took out my new brand new checkbook <laughs> from Clydesdale Bank, and of course the checkbooks in those days. Um, you know, that was enough. You know, you didn't even, I think you didn't even need a card. You might have done, I can't remember. But, and, and I wrote a check and I bought the, the print and got it framed. And and uh, the, the smile was wiped off his face, you know. But I still got that piece of art. I, 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 you could offer me insane amount of money for it and I would never sell it because it's it means so much to me, you know. Yeah. It's the first thing I ever bought. I bought it not as a affectation I bought it is something that meant something to me and I've used that image in some of my uh, movies I've used it in some of my still work and I've definitely used it in some of my novels it's been a huge part of the journey of my life that piece of art so art was embedded in who we were as a band we weren't we weren't scared of it even songs like Masquerade we talk about Picasso's Guernica mm -hmm. now how many bands managed to get Guernica yeah. into a song? Not many. And that, how many would want to? You know, one of the things that I feel so let down about contemporary music and new, allegedly indie bands is 
they write all these kind of self-wallowing, shoegazing love songs or broken heart songs, and it's like there's nothing else going on in the world. Yeah. And well, like, there's certainly plenty of material going on right now. Well, there is indeed, yeah. and 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 you know we try to see that. You know, in Burning Cities, we wrote songs like burning cities well there you go uh kings of the new world order you know Mm. a world on fire i mean i think you know we've got we're you know we might be we might be irrelevant in the bigger picture but we're relevant to us the music still feels very fresh to me that the the work you produced in the last few years well the words are on it i mean i'm very proud of that we haven't stepped back from uh you know i think as i say kings of the new world order i mean we couldn't be more right with that song or burning cities you know it's just uh and even the song refugee you know we, we wrote a song mm-hmm. called refugee and we're about to see one of the biggest refugee crises in europe since the last one yeah there's a great book called picasso's war have you read that i haven't read it but i know the book yeah. i've got it i'll give it to you yeah. it's um it's all about picasso's involvement in in uh the spanish fa- civil war yeah yeah and uh, evacuating a lot of the the, the masterpieces uh, out of paris and things so um i uh, <coughs> well, well, that well maybe we could talk about your your your, your books because since we've got a few of them in front of in front of us, I, I forgot to bring your book on the Armory Show. I'm sorry about that, but uh, y- two of these books you've written in the time that I've known you, um, Speed of Life and also Into the Void. Um, we've uh, the first time I interviewed you was for the Outwith Festival in Dunfermline, and we we t- we went through uh, Into the Void in detail. Maybe you could talk about the speed of life. Uh, well, the speed of life was um, my first novel. I did it with a company called Unbound, which is a very big company run out of London. Who um, it's a crowdfunding basis, and uh, uh, we managed to get to the number to go ahead and make the book. And I, I wanted to. I've always been a bit of a David Bowie um, uh, fetishist. You know, I love everything about him. He's meant a lot to me throughout my life. And he's always been unashamedly a science fiction aficionado. And I've, I love science fiction very much. You know, it was part of my life as a young kid here in Fife, living in a mining community, but reading Isaac Asimov, John Wyndham, Brian Aldiss, Michael Milkoff, all these great writers, kind of took me to not just another place, but to another planet, mm. another species. and. And, and th- th- of course, essentially, the underlying theme in all of these books is about alienation and um, not feeling part of something and looking for something beyond that. And David Bowie's music, of course, that's exactly what his music is about. So I, I kind of combined all those ideas, really, in the same recipe and came up with this idea of two aliens coming to the U- uh, to, to Earth in search of David Bowie. Because mm. on the planet they come from, they don't have this thing called creativity. And so... They, they decide after he, uh, um, they hear a sample of David Moy's music, they suddenly feel a tingle factor and something they've never felt before. And they go in search of what that was because they want to understand what that emotional response was because they've, n- they've never had it before. And they w- want to understand the process of creativity. So really what the book's about is an investigation of where does creativity come from and h- how is it, what is that weird organic sensation that you have when something really hits you, be it a piece of music, be it a piece of art, theatre, you know, or a movie, um, what, what, where does that come from? So it's, it's essentially a quite serious book, it's an mm. investigation, but on top of that it's essentially a, a love letter to David Bowie yeah. through the eyes of these two beautiful aliens and um, at the time um, I decided to make them non-gender specific aliens because mm. uh, that's c- the androgyny of David Bowie's kind of many characters uh, that he's created from Ziggy Stardust to the film where you kind of had those qualities yeah. um, uh, not knowing that of course this was the kind of pre woke them that were now in uh, that this was a kind of prophecy of a <laughs> kind but uh, it was great fun to write but at the heart of it um, as I said in my introduction is a pop culture uh, philosophy where pop music uh, are the general zeitgeist of our lives are part of us, you know. So it's not like these things are, y- there's not a, you're not being dismembered. It's not, creativity belongs to everyone. It's just a matter of how you use it. 
people will use it in different ways. I tend to use it um, to make stuff because I love making stuff mm. and um, it'd be it writing, music, whatever. Um, and I'll never ever stop doing that. And uh, uh, the, the origins of when I wrote The Speed of Life, I never ever thought about, am I going to get plaudits for this? Am I going to get good reviews for this? Am I going to be, you know, is this going to be turned into a movie? All that kind of bullshit never really entered my mind. I did it because I really wanted to do it, you know, and... Uh, it's a wonderful story, I, although I don't think there are any copies left. It's now out of print. It's right? completely out of print now, and um, I like that. I, I, I don't know if it sounds selfish, but all of my books are the same. I put a limited number on them, and then when the publisher comes back and says they'd like to republish it, I say, no, I don't want it. I want it just to, that's it, you just move on. As you move on to the and, next and, one. And it makes, it's interesting because it, it was two things at play there. It makes people grab it then, because yeah. there's not going to be that many of them, and um, and then it kind of it suddenly moves into the world of cult, which I really like that world. So uh, um, so I don't have boxes of them lying around or anything. There's no copies of the Speed of Life left at all now. So uh, um, I, I don't know what will happen with that. I, th there is people who would have been talking to me about making a movie of it, but because of the scale of it. Mm. and the transportation through different time periods, I would imagine it'd be very, very expensive to make. So it's not a movie I would ever make because my movies are uh, very small budgets and very ambitious, but you couldn't do The Speed of Life for a um, small budget. My, s my second novel, Into the Void, was actually a movie. It was turned into a movie called Newtown Killers. Yeah. Um, it was optioned by a company, a film company, a big, quite a big film company, and... Um, but the some of the nihilistic qualities of Into the Void, and it's also a science fiction underbelly to Into the Void because the central character, Alistair Ross Konikov, he's taken the name from Dostoevsky's novel Crime and Punishment, um, is uh, another character who's landed on Earth trying to understand sensation. And it's me, try it's really these characters are me trying to understand these things. Mm. What is creativity? What is the tingle factor? Why we so obsessed with sensation rather than the the more substantial stuff that lies beneath that? Um, you know, I feel like a lot of art now is about sensation rather mm. than something much more deeply serious. It's just about that visceral high impact thing, and the uh, the, the, the that's the idea. That's there's no other idea to it, which to me is a waste of time. But this guy becomes obsessed with that so much so that he kind of brings Armageddon on us, you know, but mm. it's an interesting story. Uh, I work with a small publisher called Bracket Press, who are one of the last remaining handsetters of type in Europe, I think, and they work out of the north of England, and they do everything beautifully, beautiful paper, beautiful layouts, great design, and uh, I really enjoy working with them, and that goes back to the punk thing again, that's a... Uh, it's not really. I'm not in control of it because they are. It's they're the publisher, but it's done really beautifully. There's no sense that we're doing this for money. It's just to do a, a wonderful object, and they actually end up do making money. They, yeah. they do make money, so it's great. And the way I work it is, I don't take the money. I just put the money into the next book, so yeah. uh, I can keep them going. And you know, and playing with the kids is a great way to get the books to the end user that yeah. I would want because people who come along to my concerts actually like reading books like The Speed of Life or Into the Void because they understand all the references that are in it when they're reading the book and suddenly the characters are at an Echo and the Bunnymen gig or they're listening to Richard Ashcroft or they're listening to Susie and the Banshees or Royal Blood or something. You know, they, they get all those references, so yeah. it I works for them. I'd like to mention the fact that I mean, when, when I look at old video clips of the skids and when I look at all of your, your, your books... It's clear that you've got a very, very strong visual sense, and I'm an artist myself. And you know, I'm always impressed by your knowledge of, of visual art and the, the history of art. You seem to have a, a very broad knowledge, and you you, se you seem to be as fascinated by by visual art as you are by by music or or anything um, else. Well, that's very can be say so. I mean, I'm not sure that's entirely true, but I I do I wouldn't say I have a wonderful knowledge of it, but I do love it. And I find it inspiring, and I go to galleries a lot. Um, I hate the pomposity of the system, the gallery system. 
Uh, I really don't like curators very much because it's all about their CV rather than the art. Mm. And, and, and often I come at it from a different point of view. I'm thinking of the people going to the art yeah. and I like to That's be in should. amongst them and see them sharing it. Um, I actually went with you to see the new Francis Bacon show at the Royal Academy, uh, Man and Beast, and it was something else. You know, It was just like you're seeing the work of a true artist uh, on display in the most magnificent circumstances. But when you see some of those big triptychs in the flesh, mm. they are really overwhelmingly amazing. You yeah. know, you've seen, I've seen them in magazines all my life because I'm a, you know, really deeply inspired by Francis Bacon's work. But when you see them for there they are in front of you, they're actually beyond the horror of the subject matter. There's something incredibly beautiful about them. And I know Bacon was an interior designer, but and you think, well, what's that got to do with his work? Actually, it's got quite a lot to do with his work because of his choice of colours and mm. the way he lays things out. I don't think... The compositions know, are, are perfect. In yeah, those and, 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 and also it's got a scintillating quality, but you suddenly put it against a yellow background. You, it's almost like it's been all... Th it's thought of for an environment, in a sense, you yes. know, so... Uh, it was kind of magical. Uh, I never really thought of his work like that before. Like there were, because I always thought them as anti-consumable. Because you know the, the, they're not the picture kind of pictures of a wee harbour <laughs> and mm. with boats and seagulls in it. This is like the horror of life. This is the <laughs> darkness of our souls. But actually, sometimes against the most incredibly beautiful, seductive. Um, kind of flat colours like yellows and pinks and stuff and your greens and you're going, oh my God, these are actually beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and so I've, I've never really understood that about it before. Uh, but I also like to watch people looking at art and, and you know, just see what they get out of it because for some people it's just something, it's just a box that they've ticked. But for other people, they're looking for stuff and so it means they're taking it seriously, and I love that, you know, um, that people take it seriously. It's, it's interesting that you're underlining the importance of actually going to a museum or a gallery and looking at the work in person, because so many people think that they have seen your work or have seen art, but actually they've only seen it on their phone or in a book, and looking at a Picasso in a, in a, in a catalogue yeah. is not the same as seeing a Picasso. Exactly. There, there's a sequence in, I've, I've got a book coming out next year called um, the Alabama song is about a Scotsman who opens a whiskey bar in Berlin and he's, he's not opened yet and he's just getting ready to open in this basement bar in Kreuzberg um, where I live uh, from 1979 and it's an area I know incredibly well and he opens this bar and this guy comes in called Heinrich and he says, ah, so this is the famous whiskey bar and, and um, Lang, the, the character, the Scots guy who's opening the bar goes, well, it's not famous because I haven't known you. He says, no, 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 you're misunderstanding, Harry. He says, you see, you're the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about this bar, but, but nobody will come because they've already been there in their heads. They won't be coming here. And they'll be at dinner parties. So you've been at a whiskey bar and everyone, oh, yeah, I was there. It was incredible. Mm. Or in 10 years' time, they'll be saying, oh, I really miss that amazing whiskey bar. It was the, I had the most amazing time there. Do you remember? Oh, my God, I went to a party there. Was but none of that happens mm. because... You're, you're hot now before you've even opened, mm. but next week you ain't hot again. <laughs> that's when you open, so it's all over. Yeah. Which, of course, is not true because his answer to that is, but you don't understand whiskey because whiskey is about slow consumption. It's about meditation. It's not about uh, being online. It's not about Instagram. It's not about flicking through things because as you enter the bar, it says as you enter, no internet no phones, you know, right, so you have to right. leave all that outside. They have book evenings and movie evenings and slow sampling of whiskey. It's about conversation. It's about people. And you'll never allow anybody in the bar to drink alone. You're not allowed to drink alone because you must never drink whiskey alone. Mm. So there's got, it's got its own different ethos, which is about the slowing down of time. Mm. And, and what you're saying is you know, the speeding up of time. I saw it in a catalogue. I saw it on the internet. I read a review. I don't need to go. But the reward from going is manifold because you're in front of it, and you can you can you know you can really review it yourself. Yeah, you don't have to you don't have to be worried about being embarrassed about your own review. Take a pencil, write some down. Why why did he use that color? What why is he doing that? 
what does it mean to me? What was the first impact I got? These are all wonderful things. You don't have to tell anybody about yeah. these thoughts. Um, and it helps, it helps you understand it even more. But you can't get that from a catalogue. It's not a different feeling. This is like you're in front of it. You're communicating with it. The artist is in front of you. Yeah. I, I always feel that a, a really good painting, a masterpiece, has the ability to put silence in a room. You know, it, it, it um, takes charge of the room. Yeah. And uh, it can be a life-changing moment standing in front of uh, yeah, a, 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 a great painting, a great well sculpture. I felt that even at the baking show the other day where the first part of the exhibition was very busy and there was too many people, I thought. And some of that early work wasn't great anyway, so I didn't really spend any time there. I just moved through it quickly, and then mm. I got to the wow moments, and yeah. then I spent time there. And in the early part, there was a hubbub of noise, and it was irritating. But when you got to that, it was almost, uh, you were in kind of, it was the theistic. It was kind of suddenly, it was, you were in this world of uh, confusion, reverence, meditation, uh, fear, all of us and joy, mm. all all in the same room, but y nobody was talking about it. They were just like, "Wow, mm. you could feel it." Now that sensation with the all the underlying elements that make it important. What I hate about a lot of new art is it's about sensation without the underlying it's components. Hollow. It's just a, it's just a sham, you know, and and it's it's it makes an initial visceral impact, but there's nothing underneath that. A lot of punk bands did that. They had made these songs that had this punch. And, and people go, oh, it's amazing. I go, but what's amazing about it? The punch was amazing, mm. but there's nothing after the punch. You yeah. know, the, the words are... And I think I suffered a lot when I was younger with the skids. That it, it was all about the punch of Schultz music and the impacts of it. And my words were misinterpreted and often mocked, whereas now it's the opposite. When I do these acoustic evenings... Uh, you mentioned the Carnegie Hall the other night. One of the really um, nicer comments that came out of the evening was, actually, I listened to the words for the first time and didn't realise they had that kind of potency in them about, um, you know, the the absolute horror of war or um, the kind of m the melancholy of a kind of being lost in a a kind of existential place and these were all component parts of the skids I mean if you think about the first album Scared to Dance it had a Jean-Paul Sartre quote on the back mm. and it was a man sitting in a brasserie cafe with a cigarette and an ashtray looking like the world was finished uh, you know we should have been joyful young ones that's not how we saw the world we were part of the Cold War generation that was looking at a kind of nuclear Armageddon on a daily basis mm. I mean uh, at my uh um, school in, in Dunfermline when I was a kid we had nuclear alarm days yeah. where they would send the signal off and we had to get beneath our desks I mean it's insane to think back to that on a Friday once a month that we had to jump underneath our desks because you know Russian missiles were going to hit Resyth and the nuclear submarine base there it's, it's, it's incredible but that's what we grew up with you know and yeah. punk rock comes out the back of that this kind of sense of um, well, you better go for it now because you're not going to be here for much longer. Yeah. So uh, you and I met about five years ago, and what prompted that was that you proposed to have an exhibition in this building, in our gallery, and um, you've, you've, you've actually had uh, two solo exhibitions here, I believe, and, uh, well, one was a celebration of, of the Skids anniversary, which was... Um, the the forty year anniversary, but the first was an exhibition of your your paintings, and uh, uh, that that's you know I, I uh, really got to appreciate that that you have many strings to your bow, you know, as as a creative person. So um, may maybe you could you could describe some of your your visual your visual art output. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because people sometimes uh, throughout the different periods of work that I've done often use the word dilettante and, um, you know, maybe you should stick to one thing. But my answer to that is I did stick to one thing, words, because words are at the heart of everything I do. I mean, I started off, you know, writing poetry quietly to myself and then taking it further in the confines of the family and library where I used to go and do my homework because... You know, my house was uh, too noisy or too many people, and I just had to do it there. 
before I went home. So I ended up using it uh, as a time to write words and songs like Into the Valley and Sense of Coming and all these words came out of there. And then, um, I st you know, I went into writing books and spoken word records. I mean, these mm. are things that not too many people are aware of. I've made all these spoken word records with T my... 10, 10.30 on a summer's evening. Uh, I did uh, 16 Years of Alcohol as a spoken word record. I did a book, uh, sorry, a, a, an album with Cocteau Records uh, called The Ballad of Etiquette using lots of kind of minimalist piano playing. Then I did a, one called An Afternoon in Company, which is just me sitting playing piano and reading this kind of psychogeographical um, imaginary journey through uh, North Africa to Japan, through Europe. Um, and uh, uh, Margaret Duras, the French writer, she gave me permission to do an adaptation of her book, 10.30 on a summer night, which I did as a record. So it's all words. Mm. And, and, you know, um, somebody said to me recently, well, you're not really an artist, are you? I said, well, I never ever said I was. I never proposed that I was an artist. But the, the art that I make is mostly photographic-based. Um, there are landscapes, sea landscapes, or barren landscapes. And on that, I place text. Mm. And, and, and sometimes it's the same picture, uh, but it's got a different word on it. And my idea is that you're looking at something, but just that one word will instigate a different thought about what that picture is and, and then what that picture is. You know? So it's, it's, it's about you, the viewer, rather than what the art is, what happens in your imagination. But text is at the heart of it. I don't think I've ever done anything that I've asked to be put on a wall or anything that's not text-related. Mm. So I do neons. I come up with... Uh, the, I mean, these little metaphorical haiku lines, um, or I take th lines from some of my songs, like uh, from Into the Valley, I've taken Land, Sea and Sky, and did a, a, um, which was part of the exhibition here yeah. at the fire station. I took Scared to Dance, which I managed to mould into my own handwriting, which was a very successful neon. I did a limited edition of them, and they all sold. And um, more recently, I've just done a table, um, with the sense of coming on it, and uh, and here is a hopefully permanent installation in the fire station, is the Erinnerung an das Meer ist in unserem Blut, which in English means the memory of the sea is in our blood, and it was from the exhibition of uh, the work that I put in here it was an exhibition that you uh, curated about the North Sea, and it was about how my ancestors come from northern Germany, from the Hamburg, Bremerhaven, uh, Ostfriesian islands and came to settle in Scotland, across the North Sea. So I took a picture from the island of Northern Eye towards what, uh, as I took the, uh, the, the reading, would be to Scotland, and then I did the same from the tip of Fife to Germany. Mm. And, um, and it was amazing, because the two photographs were identical almost. Mm. Slight difference in the cloud shapes, but not much. Mm. It was really freaky, and I did... One with the memory of the seas in our blood, and one in German, the Erringer and das Meer in unserem Blut, and um, which was a little thing about my own umbilical cord. Yeah, because my dad's family were from that part of Germany, uh, and um, he kind of kept that quiet. Really, and my other brothers tend to associate with my mother's heritage, which was Irish. I totally associate with my dad's um, heritage, which is German, because obviously I lived there with my girlfriend who was from Berlin in uh, 1979. I speak German. Uh, I love the culture. I've got a tremendous um, bunch of pals in places like Dusseldorf. I go and see a football team in Hamburg called St. Pauli. So I've got a strong, strong link to Germany, and um, uh, which I'm very proud of. And... You know, I, I say that to people, and uh, all people, all the, the only thing sometimes in the UK, not so much Scotland, but in England, they still think of Germany as World War Two mm. and Nazis, and, and that was a very brief period in German history. Mm. You know, it was from 1933 to 1945, and uh, Germany is actually one of the most progressive countries in the world now. You know, yeah. so uh, you know, w you could point out as many mistakes, horrific mistakes in British culture with imperialism or yeah, whatever. Of course, yeah. uh, and, you know, certainly in Russia, like, where do we start with that mob? You know, China. So every every country has its moment where they try and have an empire and it 
something terrible comes out of it. And undoubtedly, the Nazi period was horrendous. But the German people and the German culture now is just, it's a joy to participate in. And I'm a proper German file, G Germanophile, mm. you know, um, and uh, some of the uh, German poetry. I love Rainer Maria von Rilke is my, my favorite. Paul Celan, um, you know, and, and of course, Heinrich Heine is, is like, you know, it's just amazing. And the, the, the mighty Gotha and Schiller. So, you know, it's a country that's absolutely dripping with culture. Perhaps we can send you to Berlin to do a little uh, voice diary for us sometime. I would love that, yes, because yeah. I'm, I'm an insider there. I mean, it's interesting. I was talking to people. I did a, a, a concert yesterday, and people were talking to me about Berlin because they had met me previously, and they had said, can you s tell us some places to go to? And, I t and they told me where they were staying, which was in the middle in German, in Berlin. It's called Mitte. And that's where tourists go, right? And it's like same in Edinburgh, I guess. You know, people just mm. hang around the old town and the bits of uh, the kind of Princess Street and George Street and, and the likes, all within kind of view of the castle. Mm. Whereas actually, the more interesting parts of Edinburgh are Leith and you know, like and beyond there, Stockbridge sure. Bridge and stuff. Um, so it's the same in Berlin, of course. I mean, I'm a Kreuzberg person. Um, that's where I lived. Uh, it was a bit of a hovel when I first moved there. A lot of junkies, quite dangerous. It's mostly Turkish uh, then. It's not so Turkish now. They, much of the Turkish community have moved to, uh, just down the road to Neukölln. Um, but I love that area. So when you're in that neighbourhood, you tend not to leave it. Mm. It's, uh, like any city, cities are like London is a city woven together from villages and, and turned it into this massive city. Berlin's not so big uh, as uh, London. And Mitte is very international. It's a bit, you go into a restaurant and they speak to you in English, which mm. is annoying. It's German, they should speak German, you know, and uh, there's a, there is a backlash against that at the moment. But in, in Kreuzberg, it's young, creative people. It's mildly gentrified at the moment, but it's got an energy that I love. And listen, I've been there for a long time, you yeah. know, so I'm as much part of the landscape and the fabric as... Um, a lot of other people so but it's strange you know uh, there's a thing that everyone says when they travel to munich or hamburg how polite the germans are you know mm. but actually they're not in berlin <laughs> they're the rudest real berlin people are the, probably the rudest people in the world um they're, they're very polite in bavaria i've been there oh yeah yeah there. they are of yeah. course they are but berlin's different i mean they're prussians and um so for example if you go to a bread shop and you want to get a loaf of bread, you go, oh, yeah, Entschuldigen Sie bitte, can I have a Schwarzbrot bitte? Which means, excuse me, please, can I have some black bread, please? Yeah. And if you said that in uh, Bavaria or Hamburg, of course, they would be delighted to hit you with a smell. They'd like look at you there like, excuse me, please, can I have... Whereas my son, when he goes in, he says, give me the bread, right? Right, yeah. And, and they respond immediately to him. It's like the Alexa, Amazon dot. It is, it's like boom, and, and, and uh, there's no, you know, I mean, of course, there's, uh, it's an international city now. It's now probably the capital of Europe since Brexit, and uh, I think... In, in Bavaria, they say Gruß Gott. Gruß Gott, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, and in Swiss Germans, I don't understand the word of that. So, yeah. and in uh, Hamburg, they speak Plattdeutsch, which is a different type of German too. Right. But, but it's, it's, it's a, a unique city because it was... And on the frontier of Ar Armageddon, mm. and you know, the, you got to remember when I was there, the wall was like a hundred meters from my apartment. You know, there it was every mm. day. You go, and then you, within two weeks, it's just normal. Yeah, you see these guards and stuff. It's just normal. So your experiences there feature quite heavily in your latest novel, which is not yet published. Yeah, I've got a book coming out soon called the Kreuzberg Sonata, which is followed by the Alabama song, which I've spoke about. Yeah which is the follow-up to that. And the Kreuzberg Sonata is, I, 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 uh, when I moved to Berlin, I, I wanted to write about it. Something very bad happened. My girlfriend committed suicide. And, um, and it was just, I mean, I was only a kid, but it's something I really had, I had a lot of problems dealing with. And I mean, I, I've tried to write it as a first-person singular autobiographical thing, and I just couldn't. So I decided, uh, I was chatting to a friend of mine who's a book editor, and um, they said, why don't you fictionalize it? So mm. you're, you're talking about somebody else, but it's actually you. So I created a character called Lang, 
because lang in Scotland, Scottish means long and lang in German means long. Mm. And um, obviously Scots, as you know, Scots is an ancient Germ it's a Germanic language. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of connections. And obviously my personal umbilical cord is connected by both. Um, so I wanted to write about this love story about this young Scottish guy who goes to Berlin who's fallen in love with this girl. I mean, it's a true story. I mean, I met her in Brussels at a reading I was doing at this place called the Plan K. She was best friends with this Belgian girl who run this label, Crepe School, who, who did all my spoken word records. And I was introduced to this girl, and I just fell in love in the first 10 seconds of meeting her. And she said, well, where are you going tomorrow? And I said, well, I meant to... go. I was going to move to Brussels. I was mm. leaving the UK, but... Go and live. I'm, go, I'm looking for an apartment. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm taking the train back to Berlin. She said, why don't you come with me? And I said, what time are you leaving at? And she said, 12 o'clock. And she said, she said, I'll get you a ticket. Mm. And if you're at the station, 12 o'clock. And I turned up and that was it. I got on the train with her and but I'd only met her. And I ended up in Berlin, the frontier city with this wall, like literally 100 metres. She had an apartment there. Her mother lived in the east, so I used to... Because um, my girlfriend had been, she'd got out of East with her father. The mother wouldn't come. She wasn't allowed to go back because mm -hmm. she would be, you know, imprisoned. So um, I had to take letters over to her mother because you put them in the post, but they would never get there. Right. So uh, I would have to stick it to, I felt like uh, something from John Le Carre novel. <laughs> I used to stick the letters to my chest with sellotape and go through you know, the various checkpoints. I mean, the, obviously the one that everyone always talks about in uh, the UK at least is uh, Checkpoint Charlie, mm. but there was lots of other checkpoints. Um, uh, I hardly ever went through Checkpoint Charlie because they were always looking for kind of weird Westerners. And I used to have to slick my hair down, uh, which I did anyway in those days, and, and dress differently because if you looked, you know, too outrageous, they wouldn't let you in. Yeah. And the guard there... Um, there was a guard on that gate, and I used to go through every couple of weeks. And uh, you had to change money to East uh, German money, and you were only allowed to take so much, and you weren't allowed to bring any back, so you had to spend it. And there was nothing to spend it on, I might add. But the guard knew me, and he used to practice his German on me because I was obviously trying to improve my German. And um, it was hilarious because he used to call me James Bond. Here right. he comes because I was Scottish. Yeah. And he used, to, he used to go, here he comes, James Bond. <laughs> it was very funny. So, I mean, all the horrible stuff you hear, I mean, the first couple of times it was terrifying, but, you know, it just became, no I'm trying to say it was normal. Yeah. And the East German guards had a sense of humour and uh, I wasn't smuggling anything. There was one funny time I went through, I was taking her mum some shortbread biscuits mm -hmm. from Scotland and the guards were all looking at these biscuits so I said, no, I'll open, open them, you know, so I I and I gave them a biscuit, and they absolutely loved these biscuits, yeah. these East German guards. So every time, uh, you know, I'd get them sent to me in Berlin and shortbread biscuits, and uh, I would take them to the, when I was going through, and I always gave them some. But you, you couldn't give them a packet because that was he's a bride. You right. had to open them up and Thought that, yeah. just give them a biscuit, and uh, it was great. So... I mean, you know, I talk about these experiences. People go like, no, but that's not how it is when you see all these spy movies. Well, I wasn't a spy, you know. And uh, the, the story about the biscuits, that's actually partly in, in the story, isn't it, that you wrote? It's that's right, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's in, and and the, uh, it's about really, the book's essentially about me trying to reconnect this girl with her mother. Her mother was really a tough, very smart totally indoctrinated in uh, East German socialism politics. She really believed in it. Mm. Um, and this was at the time, This was, we're talking 79, 80 here, so mm. the wall didn't come down to 89, so, you know, it was a way, way off. Uh, but we eventually, there was a couple of times, I mean, I went to, she took me to a Beethoven concert, which was amazing, in the big concert hall. Um, she was never, I would never say she was warm to me, but she put up with me. Mm. And um, then I told her that my girlfriend had got pregnant. And she said it was a disaster. We were too young. And she was right. It was a disastrous thing. And uh, But I couldn't ask. You know, we were so young. I just couldn't ask her to, you know, not have it. Mm. You know, she wanted to have it. And uh, anyway, she, uh, for a variety of reasons, lost a kid and 
spiraled in a depression where she blamed herself because she had taken some drugs and that caused a miscarriage. So she blamed herself and then committed suicide. So it was pretty awful. Um, and the second part of the story is called The Alabama Song, which is about Lang going back to try and at last deal with the ghosts of the past. Right. And, it's, and it works, you know, yeah. for him. It's a, it's a lovely story, The Alabama Song, very uplifting. Whereas Kreuzberg Sonata, well, the title tells you that it's kind of got a th melancholy to it. And it's a bit fun. It's a bit fun in places, but... But it's a it's a love story, you I've know. I thought I haven't read the, the entire manuscript, but from what I have read, it's, it's beautifully written. I think it was you know some of your your best work yet. Well, I've got my own style of writing, and some for some people it works, and some people it doesn't. I mean, there's people close to me who don't like my writing at all, and they're very open about it. Um, but there's lots of other people who it connects with, you know, in different ways. But definitely, I have developed a style. But but but. Writing these things is not new. I've been writing since I've been 14, you know, mm. so uh, I'm 62 this year, you know, so I've been writing for a long time. I write every day yeah. as uh, uh, I'm writing an another thing at the moment. And and like I say, when I go to exhibitions, I write about them. You, uh, you always use a fountain pen when you write, don't you? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like the, the words are important. And I think when you're sitting on a telephone, writing or a iPad or a, a Mac or whatever, you're speed writing. Yeah. You're writing fast. You're at no point in time thinking about what that word looks like. Yeah. You're not thinking about what that word sounds like. You're just looking at the shape of the sentence. Whereas when you write with a fountain pen, it's got a sound, it's got a feel, it's like you write with blood. Mm. It's much more important. You're much more careful. And I write in a very elliptical way where... Um, sentences can be one word uh, and it's got a, a musicality to it, the yeah. rhythms, so I'm thinking it's four, four, three, three and so there's a music at the heart of the, the rhythms um, and uh, it's important to do that slowly because, uh, I mean, I've got all the other tools, I've got a Mac and I've got a bypass and I do do that stuff because mm. I have to of course, but that's later in yeah. the process and then what I tend to do is edit myself to the point where I can edit it no more. Then I hand it over to somebody and then they come back. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes, like for the speed of life, um, when uh, the speed of life was finished, we, we, did, we made changes to my editor, said, let's do this, we need this, we need to explain this a little bit more, take, uh, take more of the kind of sci-fi elements out. And then... Just as it was about to go to print, mm. David Bowie died. Yeah, yeah. And which was just the most tragic thing. And the publishers came back to me and said, your book's already out of date, you know. So you need to deal with this in the yeah. book. So I, I basically had to go and start all over again. Right. And it was just the most, I mean, I was wrapped up in the sorrow of Bowie's death and how do I weave that into my story and in the end the story became about something else it's amazing really how one the seed of something can be sown in a way that you'd never have considered because i think, I think that's what makes an artist an artist is their ability to adapt to to a limitation like that or, or a problem you know and you, you can twist it to yeah. your advantage yeah yeah i mean well the, pro the problem became a positive thing in an end or the tragedy became out of the tragedy came something positive because what I did with the whole story was actually make it part of David Bowie's imagination. Mm. So all these things were happening. You thought it's physical reality, but mm. in fact it was David Bowie looking back at his own life through the eyes of these two strange creatures, yeah. trying to make sense of his life and, and trying to make sense of the horror of some of the things that happened in his life and his experiences in Berlin and New York and Los Angeles and London of course so it's a kind of um, he, he obviously because of that he's moving through different periods and through different um, cityscapes so it gives the book a kind of fluidity but but the, the, the big denouement of the book is the fact that actually these people are figments of his imagination, he's created them and once He's happy with 
you know, reconciling himself to his life, he fades away. And, and the character he's created, one of them's already faded, but one of them's still surviving, doesn't want to believe they're not real. So they dive into the sea, to the Hudson, to mm -hmm. the river, sorry, the uh, Hudson River, in the freezing cold winter, because the boy died in January, mm. uh, and to see if they're real or not, because they want to know. Because essentially it was a search for, you know, what, this, what is creativity, this thing, sensation. And, mm. and uh, I'm actually working on a project at the moment where it's set during World War II and on the island of Northern Eye in the Ostfriesian Islands in the north of Germany, where a, a person's washed up on a beach and found by German soldiers. And they think it's a Royal Navy person who's been in a shipwreck or it's a... REF pilot, is, but they're naked, this person just, and, and can't speak. And they take them off for interrogation, and it's the same character. Right. And this character's been washed up into a different period of history, and, and so I wanted to look at the horror of Hamburg. And the reason I wanted to do that is because that's where my dad's family were from, and they were caught up in the, the which I think was a war crime, um, what happened in Hamburg, the, 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 the kind of the bombing of a city that was essentially civilian city right. that turned into an inferno um, out of uh, vengeance for what happened during the Blitz. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, it was hardly the moral high ground. You know, it's like, but you're destroying civilians, mm -hmm. you know, women, children, uh, elderly people who are not the problem, you know. Yeah. So uh, I kind of said that's something I want to investigate that I've never understood, uh, but I want to do it through this person being washed up on a beach, so they they kind of survive. So I like making links in all of my stories. There's characters in Into the Void who are in the Speed of Life. Uh, there's a character in the Speed of Life who's in a cafe where Bowie goes to have a and falls in love with one of the aliens, and she turns up in my story, the Alabama song. Right. You know, so they're all characters that. Are alive for me, you know, in a in a funny self created, like most people, and I'm sure it's the same for you. You you, you know, you, a lot of the time of the hours of the day, you're living in your own imagination, yeah, totally and your own right. imagination. I'm sad to say, in the world we live in, is a better place to be than the kind of brutal reality yeah. that's out there. But you can't, you know, it's not a place you can inhabit for too long, or you would go mad. Yeah, I think that's where madness lies. You know, just by people dwelling too long inside their own uh, imaginative bubble. Um, but you need to come out of that. But it's a good place to be. I always find it, you know, like very rewarding. That's why I love writing because mm. I'm, I'm in that world. I don't write social observations, you know, and that's why I like writing about art. Not to show uh, like an artist like yourself, but just my own little meditations. And sometimes it's just an epigram or something or just an observation about um, a, the baking show, for example. Or yeah. I even do it now with food, you know, like, just, just to practice writing all the time. And as I say, I'm 62 this year. I've been writing almost professionally since I've been 14. And I, I'm still practicing every day. And it's the ones who don't practice who will never, you know, people say, oh, you're a lucky shit that you've been able to do all these things. It's no luck. Mm. It's hard work. Yeah. Um, but I never stopped practicing. I, I, I was working with some musicians recently who wouldn't even tune their own guitar up. <laughs> Because that's what somebody else does. They just turned up yeah. and didn't understand, you know, why they couldn't have cr a kind of the fluidity of the creative process. Mm. It's because this, this is not a gift that's given to you. This is hard work. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the generations that have followed what we did in the punk thing, there's a horrible sense of entitlement with a lot of them that they just think, I want to be a star. I want to be a great painter today. I don't want to put the graft in. I don't want to put the hours in. Craft is is woefully absent from so much contemporary art, and it's it's a shame. It's it's not uh, it's not something you can just catch up on. You know, you you have to start early and, and build upon it incrementally every day. Yeah, and it's the same with music, of course. I mean, th that's why a lot of the time I turn to artisanal work. You know, where I really like ceramics and stuff. Cause yeah. You can't be shit at ceramics. Yeah. Because, you know what I mean, it's so technically skilled. Yeah. Whereas sometimes with art, you can be really not very good and get away with it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I, I mean, I know we had a discussion recently about an artist's work, but there's certain works that 
I like the atmosphere of the expressionistic work, mm. you know, very, a lot of the great German work from the Weimar period, you know, Max Beckman, uh, Otto Dix, George Grosser, huge influences on me and my taste. And so I'm never really looking for technical, I'm looking for the technicality of atmosphere, mm. you know, because creating atmosphere is a technical skill yeah, of in course, itself. Yeah. So I, 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 for that kind of work, I'm looking for that. But I do love school, well, even my um, uh, neons, when I first started making them, I said, no, I have to bend the glass because mm. it's not art if I don't do it. Because, uh, But I couldn't do it. I could do it, but uh, the breakage was so expensive. Yeah. That the guy said, well, listen, this is not a rehearsal for free. You're paying for this. Yeah. So what are you doing? He said, you've created the, the, the words. The words are your creation. This is just a technical part that you don't have to do. You want, yeah. You've now taken this beautiful um, phrase or epigram or whatever you want to call it and said, turn that into a neon for me because mm. that's what we do. We couldn't do that. Well, developing a concept is a craft in itself. It's amazing how, how many people think you can just come up with an idea and go with it and that'll be fine. It's not going to work. Yeah. But you have to uh, do But also it. having the, the technical thing being it, one of the things that used to really upset me about a lot of the new British art thing was like when you saw Jeff Koons, you might not like the pop culture f frivolousness or capriciousness of it, but technically, oh my God, they were yeah. amazing. Yeah. They were sure. amazing. They were sensual. They were so perfect you wanted to touch them, right? Yeah. And I loved that. Then you would see these new British art and they looked like some scabby old bit of shit that was put together with glue <laughs> and rotten edges. And I'm like, what's that? Yeah. So my neons are stunningly beautiful because I, I work with a guy who knows how to blow the glass perfectly. He knows how to bend it perfectly. I tried and I, I, I can do it, but I can't do it like he can do yeah. it. So why bother? Yeah. So that's, that's what they explained to me. And it took them just to say, calm down. No one's expecting you to be able to bend the glass and blow it and make it look like this. We've been doing that for the last 50, 60 years. That's what yeah. we do. But we can't come up with the memory of the seas in our blood. We're astounded by that. Yeah. So that's the art. You've just chosen to take it from your picture onto a neon. So you need to calm down yeah. and stop breaking glass and let us do that. And uh, never a truer word was spoken, you know, because they were artisans, these people. I really listened to them. Mm. I think it was another artist who had told me, I go, no, that's made it worse. I have to learn to do this. But mm. it was a mistake, you know, because... It's very limiting. My, my art was the, 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 the creating th those words, you know. Yeah. And as I keep on saying, that's when people say to me, well, what is it you do? I say, words. Everything's about words. So I've, I've encountered people, you know, from the local authority who think that there's nothing to concept art now yeah. co I must say concept art is not my favourite type of art but th there is some work that I like and it's um, th th there's a, it's, a, it's a fine it's a fine craft oh yeah. Devel developing an idea yeah I mean I've had people say things to me like oh it just looks like that thing and they're having coffee bars when it says cappuccino you know you're going like uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> you're you know, too kind yeah you're just <laughs> thank you very much you know it was like uh, but in fact when you see these things in the context, like when you go into the cafe in the fire station mm. and and it's the first thing that's on in the morning and it's up there and it's got the mystery of being another language. Yeah. Uh, you have the German version of the memory of the seas in our blood there. It's quite something. It looks amazing. It really does. I, and I was watching, uh, they had some musicians play here the other night and I was looking at them, watching it, talking about it. And, and so I thought I'd very gently inquire what their thoughts were and they were really blown away by it. And yeah. And I told them I was the person involved. And it the nicest thing they said to me was, but where did you get that phrase from? I'm, I'm, I'm writing it down. I'm, I've Googled it. I can't find it anywhere. Which book is it from? I went, it's from that one. Yeah. There. And it was kind of nice because they were a bit gobsmacked at what somebody actually came up with. That. I mean, not that it's anything particularly masterful, but they imagined it had been appropriated, you know, rather yeah. than... Um, there, I w I w there's one I'm working on at the moment. It's called Dazzled by Infinity, and it's about landscape. You know, just like how sometimes the landscapes are so huge. And it's something my father told me about. His father had said who had been at the, he was in the German army and um, was obviously on the Russian front, 
and he said about how the landscape never ended. They were on the train and they were on the train for four days going further into Russia and they mm. all knew immediately there was going to be a supply problem. Mm. How can you get fuel? How can you, do you know what I mean? It's just like, once you're, Napoleon fell foul of it mm. and of course uh, the Nazis right. fell foul of this it. This country's bigger than we thought. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. And, um, and I, I, I wanted to do something in honour of that in mm. a way, you know. And I came up with Dazzle by Infinity, which I really love. And my brother, who lives here in Dunfermline, and he's a, he's a very funny guy, and he's a, I'd say he's a realist about life, you know, he's not, he doesn't have any pretensions. And he said, that sounds like a dodgy perfume to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just immediately understood what he meant. Dazzled by Infinity. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I might abandon that one, yeah. which is a shame, because if he had never said that, I would have probably made it by now. I think you should explore that option. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, well, thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Well, I think we should wrap up there. And thank you so much, Richard. It's uh, it's always inspiring talking to you. And uh, you're a great example to everybody uh, in this uh, building in this of town. How not to love their life, of, 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 of how not to live their life. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a great journey. You know, it's something that's the but the journey hasn't ended. You know, I'm yeah. feeling as fresh and as energetic as I ever did. And, you know, I, I, I must say the collaborative work, I don't have the energy for. Uh, people ask me, will I make another movie? I'm not sure. You just need so many people. Mm. Um, I like doing art projects, but it's just a couple of us, mm. uh, more like installation, film installation work. So I might do some more of that, but a full-blown movie, I'm not sure. It's just, it takes like a year and a half of your life and then the, end, the reward can be some reviewer gone, what a load of crap. You yeah. know what I mean? He's like, whereas a book, I can be working on multiple books. I could be working on lyrics, music, light installations. And these are all things that I can work with almost on my own and then push it out mm. and close the door. Whereas with a film, you're on it 24-7 every day for 18 months. Yeah. If you, and sometimes longer. And I, I just, I don't have enough time for that now. I've got to get on with stuff. But anyway, thanks for um, uh, being a great interviewer. It was great chatting to you. And uh, this is a wonderful thing you're doing here, this podcast. And I will definitely be sending you little postcards, uh, as in spoken word postcards, from whatever uh, I'm doing, if they're any use. You can assemble a slideshow for that. I'll look forward to that great. and seeing what you send us. So thank you, Richard. Great to see you.